Good evening. This is Adventist Talk. In, in Luke chapter 4, 16, that passage, that narrative on the Sabbath is revealing Christ to be the Jubilee Sabbath, the yes. ultimate Sabbath, the fulfillment of the law. Right. It is not right. about him going to church on the Sabbath as an example for everybody that was the same. Mary. And so he did that and he capitalized on that as an opportunity to show, hey guys, the Jubilee is here. The ultimate Sabbath is here. The fulfillment is here because he picks up the scroll. He, he, he deliberately finds Isaiah 60, uh, I think is a uh, 61. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the gospel, the good news, etc. cetera. Bind, um, loose, loose the prisoners and what have you. And then he's, after that, he says, this day, today, this script is fulfilled in your hearing. And Christ says, I am the fulfillment of this. So he actually used that to show he is the ultimate Sabbath. Yeah. But they are stuck, <laughs> transfixed yeah. Yeah. On, 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 on just the just the inconsequential peripheries yeah. that he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath. They missed the entire fact that he says, hey, the Sabbath, the Jubilee, is referring to me and that's what the passage is about and they were so enraged at him saying that they run him out the synagogue and and they drove him straight to the the bro of the hill on which the the, the synagogue that sits um town was built and they tried to throw him over to kill him because how dare he says he's the jubilee he's the sabbath he's the fulfillment of these things that's what the passage is about it's not about yeah. him being an example of sabbath keeping yeah. etc and so no, we don't see Christ as an example of, of, of Sabbath keeping. In all of those instances, he's pointing to himself as the greater fulfillment, yeah. the ultimate Sabbath, and, and the one who's over it, and, and man should not be a slave to it. It's such a passage of joy. I mean, what, what an amazing passage. And they don't get to, to really experience the depth of it because they're, you know, they're majoring in the minors okay go ahead <laughs> it's true it, ej a, a couple of things i gotta piggyback off that because it's just so good so you mentioned luke luke 4 and again they missed this as well i'm gonna keep harping back on this the the new creation was typified by the jubilee year which was the mm -hmm. year after the seventh seven so the eighth motif is is happening there. Christ declared himself like EJ said to to be a fulfillment of the Jubilee Luke 4 19. Every Sunday is the day after the seventh, which is like a miniature jubilee. So yeah. there's even like new creation motif that's happening there as well. But then the other thing that Hugh pointed out that's spot on is just like the Jews who missed that. And I think this is important in this discussion. I get into this with SDAs all the time. SDAs confuse the day, which is a part of the ceremonial form, with the substance. The day being like a memorial. So remember, it's to remember creation. It's to remember redemption. It's to remember. That's memorial language. But the memorial is not the thing signified. Mm. The memorial is the signifying thing of the actual thing. Yes. And they miss this. They make the day the substance. The that's memorial right. is the substance. And it's like, well, no, that, that's where you've gone off the rails because the Jews did the same thing, like EJ just pointed out, when actually, no, the day is just a memorial. And Hebrews 4 and 3, or 3 and 4, talks about this as well, that Israel essentially failed to enter into God's rest because they had the gospel preached to them by God himself, and they didn't believe. So they mm -hmm. failed to enter in, yet they were keeping the seventh-day Sabbath. 
So if they were keeping the seventh day Sabbath, but they failed to enter in, that shows a dichotomy between the day being a memorial versus right. the actual substance of what that day yeah, is supposed to point to. This is why I'm fine with saying Christians have 100% biblical basis for the practice of meeting on the first day because it's the memorial of the new creation. And all that does is point us to Jesus. That's why we're there. <laughs> we're there yes. celebrating the accomplishment of redemption. Right. It's yes. a celebration. It's a jubilee. That's why we're here. It's not, right. We're not here because of all these sort of legalistic things that they infuse into like, and then you get into these crazy discussions and that's what happens when you miss the point, you get into discussions of, well, can you go to a restaurant? Can you drive a car? Can you, you're, you're completely missing it. That yeah. that's, that's not what the, the substance of, of what's go, that sort of stuff was to point to a greater reality. That stuff was part of the shadows. Yeah. You know, um, when we first left Adventism, and um, we were attending within the first probably five Sundays we went to church. I heard this amazing uh, homily. It was called Ancient Homily on the Holy Saturday. Have you guys heard this? Supposedly, now I was in an Anglican church. And supposedly the rector there said that they believe, tradition says it was one of St. Peter's. And it's all about Christ when he died he went in to the tomb and he said, I've done it for you. And he draws um, at, uh, Adam and Eve out. And uh, and it is a tradition for a lot of Christians to on the day that Christ was, you know, uh, the tri the tri what do you call it? Tritium of, of Easter, you know, yeah. the Holy, Holy Saturday that a lot of Christians read this, hit this um, beautiful, whether it's true or not, it's true theologically, whether whether uh, Peter did it, said it or not, but the entire Christian body celebrates the Holy Sabbath when Christ fulfilled the last Sabbath by resting in the grave. It, I, I mean, it made such an impression on me. And so uh, I just wondered, had y'all heard this one? Well, I've heard of Holy Saturday because of Holy Week. Uh -huh. And so I figured that's what you're referring to. It's funny you mentioned this because SDAs, it's even on the SDA church's website. They love to say Jesus kept the Sabbath in the tomb, which mm -hmm. is supposed to be an example for us that the seventh day Sabbath is still binding. But again, you're missing the, right. the just the next point after that, which is so important, is new creation. <laughs> the new creation happens right now after that so they'll point to for example that see the disciples they wanted to hurry up and embalm the body of jesus before the sabbath because they were keeping the sabbath right they're right at the tail end of the old creation right before the turning point of yeah. the new creation and so while there is a truth to that statement and you've just pointed out and alluded to some of of that and um what what you just said there it misses like it's only half of the coin it's not the other side of the coin, right. which gives us the fuller picture about what took place um, once that was accomplished. Well, the early church, this is one of the, uh, I don't know about how many, but I know enough of the early church fathers believe this, that I'm going to bring it up. But they believed a lot of the illusions in Revelation, the stars falling, mm -hmm. all of this, uh, the moon turning to blood, all of these things were happened when Christ raised was raised on that great uh, resurrection morning because what happened is from all the people excuse me all the people of the earth had looked up to the heavens for their calendars for their daily a calendar and for their uh liturgical calendar their festivals and now when when the Lord said when the Bible talks about the stars falling, it's actually an illusion to now there's a new calendar. There's yeah. a new heaven. There's a new earth. There is now a new ca calendar and it is completely centered around Christ. He Absolutely. is now, Christ is the center of our lives. We no longer look up to the sun and moon and stars we now look to the son of God and Holy Sabbath is part 
a Holy Saturday is a part of this wonderful liturgical year where everything now is the seasons are of Christ's life. And I'm telling you, when I found that out, I, I just, to this moment, you can see I'm still praising the Lord over that one because it's such a beautiful explanation, even though there may be a, a new, uh, a double meaning to a lot of these uh you know, revelation, uh, illusions, yeah, there could be something that happens. Oh, in the but, yes. But the point is this tells you, this actually can tell you from the church fathers, they saw this as a absolutely new creation, just like what you've been saying, Miles, this whole time, Christ created a new heaven and a new earth and all the, the old was gone. Well, see, and all that language is being utilized that's in Revelation from the Old Testament, where this sort of, you know, hyper-literalism that you'll find in not just the SDAs, but all sorts of movements, um, it really creates mincemeat out of the Bible because it misses the fact that God uses cataclysmic uh, celestial language to talk about, like, deconstruction language, etc., to is. talk about judgment or to talk about the the creation account, et cetera. We were just talking about Isaiah 64 through 66 earlier. That same thing mm -hmm. is what's going on there. You have this sort of deconstruction language taking place. And in the context of what you were just getting at, the deconstruction of the old creation being remade and recreated by virtue of Christ, mm -hmm. the second Adam doing what the first Adam failed to do, doing it perfectly, redeeming what man broke. Eusebius, you you mentioned there that the talk of the the stars falling from heaven, etc. Eusebius talks about that as well. I know that we're at that point, it's like kind of like fifth century. Um, so it might be a little later than what you're talking about. But when you mentioned that, I'm like, oh, okay. He didn't necessarily, at least what I've read, he hasn't, he didn't mention like Holy Saturday in there, but he he definitely talks about the celestial language that is used um, that is pictured in Ezekiel, Isaiah, Revelation, etc., to essentially say that it's essentially this deconstruction language that's being utilized to talk about this cataclysm. It, it, it's picturing something cataclysmic, and it exactly is. That's why, you know, an atheist still has to concede it's it's 2024 from what? Um, right. why is the, why is the whole world recognizing right. and on this sort of cycle of 2024 from when, um, well, it was, it was this cataclysmic thing that radically changed and impacted the creation. Yes. And what, what, what's interesting too, I mean, sometimes I say the SDA system and others like it, they are, they are some of Satan's best tools to distract people from Christ and the gospel. Christians look at Easter and it, it's an amazing reminder of Christ and his completed work and the salvation he brought for us. Whereas at Adventists, they look at Easter weekend and Christ is just the periphery to point to and highlight the inviolable absolute nature of the sabbath the whole concept of he, he kept the sabbath even in death uh, i mean if that's the case there's nothing special about that i mean every dead man then keeps the sabbath in death <laughs> which which violates their doctrine of, of soul sleep that the dead knows nothing right. you know and if we're going back to the old law as to how to keep the sabbath then what were the activities this dead man was doing that indicated he was keeping the Sabbath even in death, you know? So it, it kind of defeats the argument 
but it reveals the fact that these groups are bent on removing the focus from Christ and the centrality of Christ in the gospel to place it on legalistic matters. Yeah. We look at Easter and it's joy. It's beautiful. It's amazing. We celebrate Easter. They don't. When they look at Easter, it's only to chastise. See, the Christians know what, what they, Good Friday is when he died. And they know what, what Sunday is when he resurrected. But they forget the day in the middle. They forget the Sabbath. When he rested in the tomb and kept the Sabbath even in death. You see what has occurred there? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it is, it is, it is anti-Christian and it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. Because the, the entire thing is focused on Christ and his victory that brings salvation that others in the new creation or the eighth day. The, the, the church, early church fathers made a big deal about the eighth day as well. Mm -hmm. Christ started this new creation and brought new life uh, to humanity. And it is beautiful. But sadly for them, that's irrelevant. The only thing that matters is it serves as an ident identification for the Sabbath so that they could be transfixed on the Sabbath. Lauren Siebold over at uh, Spectrum Magazine, um, he wrote an article titled The Case for Easter Saturday. Oh, and no. <laughs> it was it was quite the the spin. He, he starts off talking about, uh, well, his neighbor was giving him a hard time and... He was like, do you have Good Thursday or do you keep Good Thursday? And Lauren Siebold said he was kind of like perplexed or confused. And his friend said, well, you're an Adventist, right? You guys do everything a day sooner than Christians. <laughs> and so it was kind of a, a, a joke. But he said that that basically caused him to think about that there's a, a case for Easter Saturday. And he, he really, he again, he's in this sort of like, progressive strain of of adventism you know so he's not like the old school right. but he's still saying all these same things ej is saying but just in like a different way and it's like man you would only be making these arguments if you didn't understand that like no you're you're still and and the practical outflowing of it is is you guys are still stuck in the shadows the analogy that i use all the time is like christians are in the jacuzzi it's like a spiritual jacuzzi we're just like, ah, we're just like basking in Christ, the goodness of the gospel. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just the, the, the true sun is beating down on us. Um, it, it's amazing. And then you've got groups like the Adventists who they insist that they're in the hot tub. No, no, we're in the hot tub too. We're in the spiritual jacuzzi too. When in reality, they're in the shadow of the hot tub, freezing cold, shivering, um, but asserting, no, no, we're in there. We're in the, the jacuzzi. It's like, dude, no, you're not. You're in the shadows and you're shivering, freezing cold because you don't understand the substance, which you're in the shadow of what's being cast by the substance. Get out of the shadow. Come get in the, the actual jacuzzi and bask in the sun. Well, I was just reminded of that, you know, kind of analogy there when reading his article. And it's just like, man, you're trying to like spice it up to really just prop up what the SDA church has turned into an idol. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, okay. You want to go into the, that, what the early church did. We've been talking about it this entire time, the early church. So I feel like we might be a little bit redundant, but is, you know, do you guys want to say anything about how did Constantine change the Sabbath? Oh. Um, you know, th did the early <laughs> church keep Sunday, keep the Lord's day? Well, yeah, even before we get oh, there. Ahead. One second, Miles. Um, the, the, the early church had a lot to say about Romans chapter 14, 5 and 6 in relation to the Sabbath, as well as Colossians chapter 2, uh, 16. In fact, um, in volume 2, we've had in plain sight, I, I give a rundown of all the commentaries of the early church I could have find on their take on Colossians 2, uh, 16 and 17. Um, they, they clearly understood that based on the principle of Romans uh, 14, 5, and 6, one man esteems one day above another, another esteems all days alike. Let everyone be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who, who um, regards the day, he regards it to the Lord. The one who does not regard it is to the Lord, he does not regard it. And so right there, that makes the Sabbath and all other days irrelevant, as well as it gives credence to whoever wants to regard days holy. And God accepts that. 
And then in Colossians 2, 16 and 17, where Paul states clearly that no one ought to judge a believer on their eating and drinking, festival and new one on Sabbath. These things are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is Christ. They understood that very clearly that believers were, were are and were not bound by the shadows and the ceremonies of the old covenant. We have Christ as the new covenant reality. And then he resurrected on the first day. That brought salvation, that brought redemption, that brought peace, that brought reconciliation, that brought in a new creation. And they made a big deal about that. That, and, and it's from the first century. Mm -hmm. It didn't just get invented, you know, when Adventists came on the scene. From the first century, we we, we trace from 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 um from Barnabas, the Priscilla Barnabas. Uh, straight through to to um, the Didache, the Didache right, which which is arguably written from about the the, the 70s or 80s. The Didache yeah. was was around when some of the the disciples were still around. Certainly John, mm -hmm. and they express their conviction about the Lord's Day and why they called Sunday the eighth day or the Lord's Day and the theology around that. And then coming on through to Oregon, Eusebius, I mean, so many church fathers, straight through to the reformers, mm -hmm. consistent understand and theology of the Sabbath as the old creation and uh, legalistically keeping it to be right with God is, is Judaizing. And in the eighth day as the new creation, the birth of the Christian church and, and that which has has, has dispelled the darkness and brought in the light and reconciled God to, to man, et cetera. It's, it's very beautiful. I have a lot of these uh, in, in um, volume one as well as volume two. Tons yeah. of them look at the early church theology yeah. on the Sabbath and the eighth day and what they had to say about that. Yeah. I could... Uh... Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say that this, this is a topic, um, you, you can, you can cut me off when, when, when you need to, when you need to cut me off, because again, this is just an area where the SDA church has to dismiss all of these individuals as heretics. That's a forgery. For example, they'll, I, I, well, I shouldn't say they, there's a lot of Adventists, depends who you talk to. Um, they'll tell you that all of Ignatius's seven epistles are, are forgeries. Um, th those aren't, those aren't, or he's a heretic or one of these sorts of things, but if you're, yeah, but if you're actually, and, and then they'll say the history outfolded to where there was a, a descent between Jews and Gentiles and the Gentiles out one over the Jews. And first it was, um, they wanted to be evangelistic in their efforts to convert people. So they were willing to abandon the seventh day because they knew that people would be um, off put by the fact that that's Jewish, uh, these sorts of things, to where then there grew to be hostility between Jews and Gentiles, etc. So they'll typically place the, the fathers on the side of, well, they were part of that. They hated the Jews crowd. Um, and so they'll try and do these sorts of appeals. But this is this is just nonsense. You mentioned uh, mentioned some of the earliest ones, and you specifically asked about Constantine. So I cite a lot of the fathers prior to then, um, which was the fourth century for those that do not know. But all that was happening post Constantine with people like Eusebius, Athanasius. Well, that's around the same time. Um, is a, a building upon what was previously laid out by people like Ignatius, etc. A lot of people don't understand these people were not systematic theologians. So when you're looking back on them, like you'll, I've heard people criticize like some of Oregon's homilies or origins homilies, and they'll be criticizing it as though they're expecting it to be like a systematic work when it's like, well, that's not what a homily is. A homily is Correct. a sermon. It's mm -hmm. typically exegetical in nature, like Chrysostom. Uh, we talked about that the last time I was here. Um, Golden Mouth is, is constantly um, doing expositional teaching. Well, he wasn't a systematic theologian, and so you can't read back onto these individuals, those sorts of things. So we have to work with what we actually have, which is uh, Justin's dialogue with Trifo, Ignatius's epistles, the Didache, 
the Epistle of Barnabas, but some lesser known ones. Um, and I know that there's another way uh, of saying this, um, and I'm probably going to butcher it here, but the uh, the the Didascalia uh, Apostolorium. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Pretty good. I butchered my <laughs> I butchered my what my Latin. Um, or whatever it might be there. Um, But you've got other spurious um, sources outside of there, but just a couple that this one, for example, just completely obliterates the SDA historical narrative around the great controversy, which is really what's informing all of their uh, history. But this is an, or, and I cite this all the time. This is origins homilies uh, number 23 on, or or rather um, on numbers four. So it's homily number 23, but it's on number. He's preaching through numbers chapter four. And when making application, so he goes through, which the Sabbath is talked about in Numbers chapter 4. When going through the text and making present-day application, this is in 220 AD, Origen says, on Sunday, none of the actions of the world should be done. If then you abstain from all works of this world and keep yourselves free for spiritual things, go to church, listen to the readings and divine homilies, meditate on heavenly things. That's before Constantine. Uh-huh. They're going to church. He he just said, what he described there sounds like what Adventists are doing on Saturdays. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So uh-huh. that's before Constantine. Same individual, his commentary on John 2.28, Origins commentary. He says, hence it's not possible that the day of rest after the Sabbath, hmm, what's the day after the Sabbath? Should have come into existence from the seventh day of our God. On the contrary, it's our Savior So there's this dichotomy again between the substance and the memorial. The day is not the substance. Notice that again. Hence, it's not possible that the day of rest after the Sabbath should come into existence from the seventh day of our God. On the contrary, it's our Savior who, after the pattern of his own rest, caused us to be made in his likeness due to his death and hence also of his resurrection. So again, new creation. He's essentially saying the same thing Justin was saying, that Ignatius was saying, etc. Marius Victorinus. This is in his the, the Creation of the World. He says, this is in 300. So again, we're still before Constantine. He writes, quote, the sixth day is called, um, and he, he uses a Latin term there, so again, I'm probably going to butcher, butcher it, but uh, Periskev. Um, that is to say, it. yeah, 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 there you go. That is to say, the preparation of the kingdom. On this day, also on account of the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, we make either a station to God or a fast. On the seventh day, he rested from all his works and blessed it and sanctified it. On the former day, we are accustomed to fast rigorously, so on Friday. And on the Lord's day, this is before Constantine, They'll try and say Pope Sylvester I with Constantine gave the imposing title of Lord's Day to the first day. That's what uh, Jay and Andrews tries to say in his history of the Sabbath. Um, well, no, my friend, this is before Constantine, um, and so is Ignatius. But he says, on the former day, we are accustomed to fast rigorously, that's Friday, and on the Lord's Day, we may go forth to our bread and give uh, with giving of thanks. Oh, what's that? That's Eucharist. Mm-hmm. And let the... Uh, um, and let the that word that you said again earlier, Elsie, that I can't pronounce, let that become yeah, a rigorous yeah. fast, lest we should appear to observe any Sabbath with the Jews, which Sabbath he, Christ, in his body, abolished. Mm-hmm. So again, before the Jews, there's a dichotomy that's happening here. There's something different about the new day, the new creation, that is distinguished and separate from what was happening previously. This is before Constantine. This is just the historical record. So again, you have to call these people heretics, etc. The reason I wanted to read those, though, is because I want to read what Athanasius says in 345. Now, this is way too soon to be attributed as well, even though it's around the same time as Constantine. Mm -hmm. Just if you study history, oftentimes it's attributed, these these things are just attributed like Constantine was able to just boom, and it just is. Right. You know, just like on a on a dime. And that's really not the way that any of history is actually. But notice what he says. This is in On Sabbath and Circumcision, number three. So for those that don't know, which a lot of your audience probably will, he's comparing and contrasting um, the Christian over and against the Jewish practices, pointing out the connection between Sabbath and circumcision. Uh-huh. He says, the Sabbath was the end of the first creation. 
the seventh day. That was the end of the first creation. The Lord's day was the beginning of the second creation, the new creation, in which he renewed and restored the old in the same way as he prescribed that they should formally observe the Sabbath as a memorial of the end of the first things. So we honor the Lord's day as being the memorial of the new creation. You're going to call Athanasius a heretic? <laughs> yeah. good, good, good luck. Because if you say that, you don't know who you're calling a heretic. You may as well just close shop and throw your Bible away. You may as well yep. not claim to. I know that they're not Trinitarians, actually, but they claim to be. You may as well not claim to be a Trinitarian. You may as well just close up shop because you don't understand who you're criticizing. But again, let's go to the East. Cyril of Jerusalem, five years after Athanasius. This is from his catechetical lectures, number four. He says, quote, fall not away either into the sect of the Samaritans or into Judaism, for Jesus Christ has henceforth ransomed you. Stand aloof from all observance of Sabbaths and from calling any indifferent meats common or unclean. Close quote. Who does that sound like? Now, what oh. the SDA church, yeah. Now, what the SDA yeah. church fails to recognize, now, when you point to individuals like this, they often will tell you, see, these people hated Jews. That's the problem. They hated the Jews. No, they hated Judaizing. Not Jewish people. They hated uh -huh. Judaizing because Judaizing, well, as uh, Ignatius says in his uh, epistle to the Magnesians, I believe it is, um, he says it's an insult to the grace of Christ to continue to observe a Seventh-day Sabbath. I tell uh -huh. this to SDAs all the time, and their heads explode. They, they think, and the reason why is because you're essentially signing and memorializing to the world. The Messiah hasn't come. We're still looking for him. Right. Where's he at? That's what that was signing. It was a shadow that pointed to the substance. And so right. to continue to memorialize that is to, again, that's what circumcision, and that's why it was such a big deal. That pointed to Christ. That was not the substance. And so they they miss that and try and label these people as being people that hated Jews when, no, that's not the case. Now, the reason I asked you, who does that sound like, is because Adventists, you know who they sound like? And who these individuals were having to deal with. Eusebius, back to 300, talks about in his Church History, Volume 3, um, not his Ecclesiastical History, but Church History, um, book, well, let's see here, uh, uh, book 27, Church History, book uh, uh, number 3, book 27. He's speaking about the Ebionites. Now, a lot of people don't know about the Ebionites. The Ebionites, he says, were accustomed to observe the Sabbath and other Jewish customs, but on the Lord's Day to celebrate the same practices as we in remembrance of the resurrection of the Savior. So for those that don't know, the Ebionites were a heretical Jewish sect, and Eusebius' comments show us that they were an exception, but also observed Sunday for worship. Now, why is this a serious problem for Adventists? I've heard Adventists who don't know who they're actually appealing to. They're more than likely doing some sort of quote mine or, or something like that. They'll appeal to Ebionite figures to claim, see, there were people keeping the Seventh-day Sabbath still. That was the true church, and they were being persecuted by the false church that was starting to develop that would eventually send them into the wilderness for keeping the Sabbath. That's what they claim, is that the church had to go into the wilderness because one of the foundational doctrines that they were observing was the Sabbath, and this enraged the papacy. So they hated the Sabbath and were sent into the wilderness. But oftentimes, they'll appeal to Ebionites, not even realizing who they're appealing to, but they don't understand the Ebionites also observed Sunday. Yeah. So apparently, the, these other individuals that you're appealing to, they even made a distinction between the Lord's Day and the Sabbath. So, yes. and again, I could keep going and going and going on this, but all of that was essentially pre-Constantine, not the typical ones that people hear, like Justin Martyr, his dialogue with Trifo, uh, Ignatius' epistles to the, um, the epistle to the Magnesians, uh, the Didache, right. et cetera. There's a ton of others out there. I mean, and I just ended there. These are on our website, so people can go and you can type in in the search bar for people that are interested. What did the early Christians believe about the Sabbath? And I mean, it's just... Yeah, Pliny the Younger. We didn't even talk about that or Tertullian. Right. Um, right. Just uh, 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 yeah, Bardasans. Uh, just 
shoot, in Tertullian, I mean, he covers it in his Apology, chapter 16, in his Answer to the Jews, um, in his To the Nations. Um, yeah, it's like, you don't tell me that that Constantine and Pope Sylvester I are the ones that instituted this. To the Nations, Tertullian. Others suppose that the Son is the God of the Christians. Oh, who does that sound like? Who makes that claim? SBA, SBA. Oh, right, 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 right. Oh, so what is he doing in To the Nations? Well, if you read To the Nations, he's dealing with pagans and what the charges were being made against Christians. Very similar to Justin's dialogue with Trifo, where he is basically giving us evidence of two groups, Christian and Jew, that are saying, well, we're different than the pagans, and they both highlight the ways that they're different than the pagans, but then also recognize and talk about, but you and I also have differences. <laughs> and so mm-hmm. it's like a double whammy for the SDA position. But it's like stuff like this is a, is a total home run. Others suppose that the sun is the god of the Christians because it's well known that we regard Sunday as a day of joy. Well, if you read Eusebius' commentary, again, I mentioned this earlier, uh, his commentary on Psalm 92, he brings this out in there where he talks about the new day dawning and how the Sabbath was from darkness to darkness and the 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 new, the eighth day is the light after the darkness, etc. Um, he talks about in there how the pagans at the time, because Eusebius is a church historian, he talks about how the pagans at the time were trying to pin that on Christians as you worship the sun when they were like, well, we do, <laughs> the true sun not the sun that's in the sky. And so they'd oftentimes tongue-in-cheek use the spelling S-U-N with a capital S Mm -hmm. to make a contrast there. And I've seen SDAs, for example, point to that as well to say, see, they were worshiping the sun, but they don't understand what's going on in the text. So I'll stop ranting and rambling. Like I said, I could go on and on and on on the subject, but um, it's not on their side, like at all, at all. You have to completely throw out all of church history and say, this is the biggest conspiracy that there's ever been in like all of the world because literally all of history is not on their side. Any seventh day Sabbath group in history, aside from the seventh day Baptist has also gone into Christological heresy. Mm -hmm. There is a connection between these seventh day groups and going off into all sorts of other heresies. I did not know that. That's really yeah. interesting, Miles. Good luck finding the Seventh-day Sabbath group in history who was not also some sort of theological, in the sense of the who God is, heretic. They're outside of Chalcedonian, you know, Orthodox Christian theology in that regard, like classical Christian theism. They have, they're either Unitarians or they're Modalists or they're Eutychians or they're like the Ebionites who had an interesting view, but Okay. <laughs> you have I'm, I'm fine. <laughs> we we have said enough. <laughs> uh, well, okay. Then then I was gonna say I, I I want our Adventist listeners to understand the 17th century was one of the greatest times where this idea of the Sabbath came back out. I mean. The the church had been dealing with the Sabbath issue at constantly, but it was usually, um, well, it was back and forth between the, the people, uh, the Christians that were just, you know, the peasants, and they very often pushed the idea of a Sunday Sabbath. But you had all kinds of people in the church, the hierarchy, trying to going back and forth and back and forth, whether this Sunday was an actual Sabbath, a replacement or substitution for the the, uh, seventh day and the the fourth commandment. But the 17th century was so prominent that it was considered the century of Sabbath wars. There were more, there was more publications arguing the Sabbath than any other topic at all. There were hundreds of books written about the Sabbath and you you talk about them, you know, uh, you know, Robert Cox and you, uh, I'm trying to remember some of the other ones that you talk about, um, Miles, but, um, oh yeah, Thomas, this, well, I mean, all sorts of Puritans. Yes. Yes. Th- Thomas Watson, John Owen. I have John Owen's commentary set right yes. right there. He talks about it in Hebrews three and four. Um, oh yeah. So the Adventist church was born right after 
this enti the entire world had been obsessed with the Sabbath. Literally over in England, there were people that were being martyred for the Sabbath, for Sabbatarianism versus, you know, uh, Sabbath, I mean, uh, Sunday not being an actual Sabbath. And the Anglicans were very upset with the Puritans. They mm. were like killed. Some of them were killed. And so to think that the the world has kept this, uh, the Lord kept this silent until Adventists came around is an absolute ignoring of so much history. The The world was almost obsessed about the Sabbath right up until, was it Rachel Preston? What was that yeah, her Richard name? Preston Rachel Oaks. Preston. So they came Preston. in and told Joseph Bates, I think, right? Wasn't it Joseph yeah, Bates? Yeah, was, yeah, he got it. About the, the you know, she was a Seventh-day Baptist. Well, and Pretty well told Bates. Yeah. yeah. So it yeah. was really wonderful. Okay, so this entire thing has been about we have discovered the most amazing thing after we left Adventism about the Sabbath. And I was going to let you guys have your last, you know, few minutes of, of, of this uh, episode telling what, what, what's it like? What was it like to discover the Sabbath after Adventism? Well, as for me, it was, it was very liberating. In that, in fact, it's one of the, the main things that uh, caused me to leave Adventism, because as I was studying at the university, um, I'm learning some aspects of church history, um, hermeneutics, Greek, and, you know, and realized that the Sabbath is not all this that Adventism makes it out to be. And, and all of us were Adventists, so we understand the baggage, the bondage, and the burden mm -hmm. that came with the Sabbath. It's, it's the linchpin of salvation. And for these 24 hours, you have to be on your P's and Q's and just trying to keep it so that you can be sealed and judgmentalized are all, all over you, wherever you turn. There's this constant nitpicking about it. And, you know, and so discovering that it is not what they made it out to be it was very liberating. Mm -hmm. And then as I continue to study scripture and then church history and actual church history, not the historical revisionism mm -hmm. and all of the, the gump that they dumped on it and twist on it to push their great controversy world and theology. then I realized that the Sabbath is it's inconsequential to my salvation, to relationship with God and, and to my overall Christian experience and that it is something I can choose to adhere to if I want or not to adhere to. And also I grew to respect um, Christians who adhere to Sunday Sabbatarianism and uh, however they feel about it, as long as they don't have, make it salvational and you know that sort of thing. So it became of, I'm just in a neutral, neutral place. Um, my church is part Presbyterian, just like Miles. We subscribe to the Westminster Confession of Faith. And the the, the, the forebears of, of my church are reformed. And so, you know, they, they were big on Sunday Sabbatarianism. And as Miles said, all of these arguments and theologies, Adventism borrowed from them, infused on the Sabbath and... And, and, and then create this Frankenstein out of it. It's from there. But we still don't have the views and theology that Adventism has on it. These things are just matters of Christian principles and just enjoying this new creation and new life that Christ has given. And as believers, we have the freedom to honor God in subscribing to Sunday and understanding the theology behind it, or we don't have to. You know, as I said, my church is Presbyterian. We subscribe to the Westminster. You know, all three denominations come together, are reformed. And the Westminster Confession of Faith is one of the major documents that define our faith. But at the same time, in spite of the theology we have about the law, the Ten Commandments, the Sabbath, you're not going to see any one of our ministers, even lay people, judging you about the Sabbath or Sunday, 
making a big deal about it, preaching about it. It's only sometimes when I do lectures or teachings of Bible studies, I'll bring out some of these things. You're, you're not going to find anyone judging, even SDAs who are condemning everybody about it. You will never find us condemning them about the Sabbath of these things because we understand that you know, these things are, are non-issues and what matters is Christ and your covenant realities, et cetera. And so for me, it was very liberating because not only am I not condemned as a result of the Sabbath and Sunday anymore, I also can fellowship with others who differ on these issues, treat them with grace and respect, even if they're wrong, even if they're dogmatic and have these crazy theologies around it. But based on my new understanding, I can treat them with grace mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. So it was very liberating um, for me. And I, I, I appreciate this new approach to Christian fellowship Christian unity and growth and maturity, et cetera. And even how I understand and articulate matters relating to the Sabbath and Sunday. And so that was very, very liberating for me. And that is where I am to this day. And it's a very healthy, balanced place to be. Yeah. Yeah. I have, so, um, man, there is, there's a lot that I could say. <laughs> um, and really it's just, yeah, get coming out of the, the shadows into the substance and, and realizing that I, I don't care what the SDA church says. I know that there's this sort of mentality that we have it all figured out. You know, we've got Ellen White and we've got 2 million extra infallible words on scripture and it sheds all this extra lesser light onto the greater light and helps us, you know, just have everything in this perfect I, I'm sorry, theology is not that way. Theology is complex. History is complex. Um, this is not a doctrine that is is boiled down. They boil this doctrine down to being this just real milk. Um, it's just it's just obvious sort of thing. And when I realized that this, uh, so the Sabbath really didn't have anything to do with me leaving Adventism. It was other things that I realized because Sabbath doesn't vindicate Adventism. <laughs> they think it does, you know, because it being part of the third angel's message, they want to focus on heralding the Sabbath and it's supposed to be this big thing, but it doesn't, I had to come to the realization that, well, this doesn't vindicate Adventism. There's other seventh day Sabbatarian groups out there. So why is, how does that vindicate Adventism? Well, it's because it doesn't. It has its own unique flavor of Seventh-day Sabbatarianism that has been filtered through the great controversy theme. So it was these other sort of things outside of the Sabbath, um, or a number of things, that really were the linchpin for me. But of course, I had to deal with the Sabbath at a certain point of, okay, well, what about this? Because they do kind of have a good point, maybe. And it came through realizing that this doctrine is not as milk toast and watered down as they want to make it. There is a biblical theology to the Sabbath, not just proof texts, not just, well, the Ten Commandments says this. Okay, well, the second giving of the law, that changes. The day doesn't change, but it's rooted in redemption and not creation. So do you understand that there's a ceremonial form to the commands? And the ceremonial form of the commands is not the substance of the commands. Mm -hmm. And the fact that the fourth commandment changes, the one command that changes in ceremonial form between the first and second giving, is the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. You can't deal with that in the system because you're just zoomed in on one aspect. You're missing the forest for the trees. And when I started learning and studying things like, well, there's new covenant realities to these old signs. Like I think all of us here, actually, I don't, I know Elsie and I would be on the same page on this, at least on, on paper um, with like the Westminster. Um, but I think you guys as well would also be in the same boat that like, circumcision the new covenant form of that is baptism the yeah. old yeah. covenant the old covenant form of passover the new covenant form is the eucharist yes yes so there's there is but eucharist and passover for example those aren't th those actually point to christ mm -hmm. circumcision baptism both actually point to christ so right. i'm willing to go the the next step in realizing that seventh day sabbath has been baptized and renewed in Jesus Christ, 
which mm-hmm. brings about a new creation. And with that comes a new memorial, like Athanasius said. And that new memorial, whether you want to call that a Sabbath or whatever, I use that term just specifically because I don't want to concede anything to Adventists. But fundamentally, yes. like Elsie was getting at, you have people who have certain convictions or certain understandings because this is a complex topic and they've maybe come to different understandings on this over here or that over here, but fundamentally they're all united. The substance yep. is Christ. Everyone's agreeing on that. Mm-hmm. We're not, it, even so like my church, for example, tries to just make the Lord's day, the day that there's like small groups, fellowship, worship. We just try and do everything on that day. It's not this like, you know, in Adventism, it was this very like, oh man, I don't get to. Whereas what I found in the Christian world, especially around people who maybe do lean first day Sabbatarian, is it's more of a like, ooh, and I got to, I get to. It's not a, oh, I have to, or oh, I'm 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 not able to, oh, I can't do this. Instead, it's like viewed as like, no, it's a privilege to be here. I'm um, privileged to be in the body of Christ and to amen. celebrate this jubilee every week and have freedom in Christ and celebrate the gospel and and feast on Christ and his benefits and mm-hmm. come to Christ at his table and like all of these things that I get to do. It's not a, I don't I can't do. It's not like oh well what about if I go to a restaurant? That that's <laughs> yeah. that's just like it, it just it yeah it it misses the like so for example again when we're just talking about my my new understandings like growing up we weren't an Adventist household that w- you went to the store on Saturday mm-hmm. not until sundown it was like not happened didn't get to go out to eat some of my friends did and I'd be like well they go out to eat on Saturday and you know my dad doesn't want to condemn his church members, but he's like in the nice way trying to say like, well, you know, they shouldn't be, but they are type stuff. Whereas where I'm at now is it kind of goes back to what we were saying in John five. Like, so we had small group when we had a newborn, our church is like 35 minutes from our house. Well, with a nap schedule of a new, of an infant, Mm -hmm. um, we didn't have time to drive home, make food, eat the food with the infant, drive back to where small group is at that point now, like 45 minutes away because it's over by the church. Mm. All this extra time, well, the only option was like to go out and get something to eat at like a local place, quickly eat, and then go over there and put the baby down to be able to take a nap. Because, you know, if if an infant misses their window, (laughs) it's just like the end of things. So are you telling me that God, are you telling me that God would wanted us to go home, the baby now, it'd be a disturbance at the small group, it just, all the ripple effects that comes with that, no, it misses the point. It misses the point. Food is a necessity. So we went and we got food, ate the food, and appreciated the person who served us this necessity, generously tipped the person. And then went to small group and were able to have our small group and the baby went to sleep. They're getting so caught up in these, well, like EJ said, and I, I tend to not even like to use the word legalistic just because I know that term is loaded in Adventism. They've twisted that to mean something it doesn't, to say we're not legalistic, but in the sense that we're using the word, yeah, you are. Because you would say, well, no, you shouldn't. You should figure out packing a lunch and bringing it to the church and refrigerating it and like... Yeah. All these things that just miss the entire substance, that the whole focus of our day, despite going out to eat, was focusing on celebrating the new creation. The fact that we're reminded every week of the gospel, of the good news, that we're on a journey right now. We're being led through the wilderness of life by a better Moses, a better Joshua, who's leading a better Exodus into a better promised land, a better Sabbath, all of these things. We're we're busy celebrating these things and these, you know, the, the, the tradition I was, I was raised in is, is getting caught up on just so many distractions, like EJ said earlier, that the devil's even able to use things that sound pious and sound biblical and sound theological and real noble. Um, and I admire a lot of SDAs for seeking to, <clears throat> you know, try and be noble and, and upstanding, et cetera. But it's like the devil is even, was able, has been able to use those sorts of things to cause people to just completely miss the the whole substance, which at the end of the day is Christ. 
Yeah. Amen. That's it. Well, I want to thank my husband. He is such a good trooper, a good sport and trooper, because he's been up for several nights. He's been sick and he drug himself in after 13 hours at work to be with us. Oh, I would miss it. Oh my God. <laughs> thank Goodness. you. You guys are you. fabulous. It was thank so you. Fun. Uh, <laughs> and so I thank fun. you for having us. Thank you so much. And I, I think you're great scholars. I love uh, your heart. This was such a privilege. And, you know, I want to share with Adventists the joy of the Sabbath because he said, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And that's what we need in this world. Right now, we need Christ's rest in a crazy world. Yep. And uh, so I praise the Lord for him, him, Christ being our Sabbath. So anyway, thank you so much. And um, yes, thank hopefully you for your, we can do thank this you for your time. I know you both have children and, and you've got a lot of stuff to do. And you shared with uh, uh, people that need to hear that and want to hear that. That's great. Thank, thank you, you thank so you. much. Thank you. Man, thank you for having us. In Genesis 22, we read the story of Abraham's obedience to God by taking his only son up the mount and being willing to sacrifice him. This story has long been a study for the Jewish people. It has been interpreted and reinterpreted by the Torah scholars. Some explain this is a symbol of how the Jews are foreshadowed in Isaac and will be persecuted, even to the point of death. angel will rescue them from total extinction. Some Jewish scholars believe that this test was an example for future generations to show them how true faith in God is. The interpretations are many. Yet the one interpretation that no Jew will consider is that the story was a shadow of Christ being sacrificed. Christ was both foreshadowed by Isaac and the ram that was slain. For Jews, they cling to any interpretation but a pre-Christ symbol. Their hearts are set against the story being purposely an antitype, having its fulfillment at the cross. For that interpretation would cause their entire religion to collapse. The spot where Abraham built that sacrificial altar by the very kindling his son carried was where Solomon's temple would later be built. The temple, the sacrifice, Isaac, the lamb, all these players would be fulfilled by Christ. He was each of them. When you extract Christ from the scene, when you are blinded by Old Testament shadows, you can lose the bigger picture, the better picture. We feel Adventists are very much like those Jews who have never crossed over into the New Covenant. They do not accept that perhaps the Sabbath was an Old Testament shadow of Christ. The physical rest became the more important spiritual rest when Christ invited us to come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This is what Christians have believed for 2,000 years. The shadow of a day was always to be fulfilled in the phrase, Behold the man.
Seventh-day Adventists are one of a handful of Protestant denominations that believe Christians should rest on the seventh day like ancient Israel and the Jews do today. They base this belief on the Ten Commandments. In addition, they believe the seventh-day Sabbath is the only day God set aside as a special day of worship. Adventists teach that in AD 321, the Roman Emperor Constantine issued an edict declaring Sunday as the day of Christian worship, and that the Catholic Church caved to the Emperor's edict by shifting the sacred day from the seventh to the first day of the week. But did the Catholic Church really change the Sabbath day to Sunday? Is there really more to the story? We begin a new series that will be exploring the answers to those questions. We will start at the beginning from Genesis to Mount Sinai, to the life of Christ, to the Reformation, through the 17th century Sabbath wars, all the way to the end of the world. We will be telling the epic tale of this holy day. This is the story of the Sabbath.